Good evening, and welcome. Good to see each one of you here. And you're most sincerely welcome in the Lord's name, and good to see so many visiting friends, family members, and others all along. And we're delighted to have you here, and welcome you to Monkstown Baptist Church. We're also glad to see Sophie and Luke have turned up, and uh, we're not put off <laughs> at all. And uh, we're really, really thrilled that they have had the desire to identify with Jesus in the waters of baptism. And that's a wonderful service. And we're so glad that you're all here to share that uh, with them and with us. Uh, just one little practical note uh, for the purposes of uh, getting changed uh, after we sing the closing hymn and before the baptisms. And after that, the toilets for male and female will be out of order just for a short time. But the disabled toilet, as you go through, uh, will be able to be used, and also the one uh, in the vestry there also. But you'll be that busy singing here and chatting to each other uh, before you go through to the tea. I don't think it'll be much of a problem, but that's just a practical note. So you're welcome, and we are thrilled to see you here. We're going to use the words of Because He Lives as our opening song, and we're going to stand to sing. Our songs tonight have been chosen by both Sophie and... Look, so we'll stand as we sing.
May let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we bow before you, we do so in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you for the Saviour who came for us, who lived that spotless life, who died that atoning death, who rose victorious and ever lives to make intercession for us. Thank you for the wonderful finished work of Jesus for us. And here, Lord, in the waters of baptism tonight, we have been given the privilege of showing forth the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and showing forth that that is our only hope. And Father, what a privilege you've given to us to be able to do this. Thank you we were able also to sit earlier at the Lord's table and show forth the Lord's death. And these wonderful acts that you've given to us are constant reminders that it took the death of the Son of God for my sin debt to be paid in full. It took the horrific death of Calvary as God's Lamb to show the seriousness of sin and Lord, we're so glad that you, through this, have opened up a wonderful way of salvation that all might come in. We praise you. And Father, as we come here this evening, we realize that in this room, there's really just a division of two. There are those who are in Christ and those who are not. And Father, we know that as you look down upon us, you can see those who belong to you and those who do not yet belong to you. And we would just ask that in our time together, by the working of the power of your Holy Spirit, there might be a deep sense of the convicting power of God resting upon your word. We are thrilled to see humility and obedience and young people. We rejoice in this, O oh Lord. And we just pray for Sophie and Luke that you will encourage them this evening, that you will bless them in their lives going forward, that you will make them strong witnesses for you in this ever increasingly evil world. And Father, we do pray that as we observe and watch what happens this evening, that we might be pricked in our heart. Lord, we remember other fellowships and centers where the gospel's being preached tonight. And you know, oh Lord, those who are being faithful to the blood and the book, especially if there's an effort being made to reach the lost, we pray your blessing on them also that this might be a wonderful night for the glory of the Lamb. So bless us, we pray. May this meeting evidence an ever-increasing sense of the nearness of the God of all creation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. going to sing again and at this time it's the power of the cross so to see the dawn and we'll stand again as we sing.
I'm turning in the Word of God to the book of Romans and the first chapter, Romans 1. And tonight, in the many things that baptism symbolizes, it is certainly the case for our two young friends that they're identifying with Jesus. And so our message is simple. I am not ashamed. Romans 1 from verse 15. So as much as in me is, says Paul, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And our title comes from verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel. Well, maybe you're here tonight and, and you've heard the word and you know that there are four gospels at the beginning of the New Testament, but you're maybe starting to think, well, what does he mean by the gospel? Well, one thing I can say is this from the scripture that we've just read. The gospel is a message that produces results. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And the result, the outcome is unto salvation. But why need salvation? Well, again, we have it in the passage that we read, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that idea of all there means that nothing will be missed. That's what makes our God different from mortal man. We have many miscarriages of justice. Justice system is flawed in many ways. There are things called loopholes. There are those who can evade justice altogether. But that's not something we can say about God. Nothing will be missed. Nothing will be overlooked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Nothing will be swept under the carpet. Otherwise, God would be a hypocrite. He would not be perfect in righteousness. He would be just like us. But sin is serious because we offend God when we don't live as he intended us to, when we don't come to him his way, the only way. And sin is serious. Sin is repugnant to God's holiness, and therefore sin must be judged by God. But having said that, the Bible also makes this abundantly clear, that God is as gracious and as merciful as he is righteous and holy. He's as loving and long-suffering as he is just. Those are the attributes of God. And these are the things that make us stand back in amazement and wonder at the God of the Bible. And it's because of the attributes that seem to us to be so different. But it's because of the nature of them and the, the complexities that we might see within them that God provided one way, one perfect way, one perfect plan of salvation. And it involved a perfect substitute, a perfect saviour. None other than God, the Son. And in that perfect plan, 
He has provided for all mankind deliverance if we'll only take it. Salvation if we'll only receive it. We can be set free from the penalty that we would have faced from that God of wrath. And we can also be set free from the power and grip of sin in our lives day to day. Such is the strength of the message of the gospel. So the gospel has a purpose. Our text says, says that it's effective. It's effective unto salvation. And there are many people in this room tonight. And we have known the power of the gospel. It's not concerned about reformation, you know, cleaning up your act, turning over a new leaf, adding a spiritual dimension to your lives. No, Paul isn't mincing his words here. He's being clear. He's being exact when he says the gospel is designed to save. The goal is salvation. If we miss that, then we've missed the whole heart of the message contained in, in the whole of God's word to mankind. Tonight we sit in the comfort of this place. The gospel is being shared across our world while we are sitting here. It's being done in a multitude of ways, in a multitude of languages, to a multitude of different people groups. But the purpose is the same. It's the power of God unto salvation. And why is that the primary goal? Why is that the preeminent focus, salvation? Why is that the transcendent theme that we might be saved? Well, it's because of what we read in Hebrews 9 and 27. It is appointed unto men once to die. And many think that's the end. But what the scriptures tell us after this, the judgment. Romans 1 and 18 says, the wrath of God is revealed. But God wants to save. He wants to save us from the judgment that must happen if he's righteous. And he has given us the instructions, the directions, the method, the plan, the way of escape, and it's the gospel. So the gospel has a purpose. But sadly, the gospel is also a message that many hide Title for our message is, I am not ashamed. And that's strange that even in religious circles, people hide the gospel. I wonder, believer, are there times when it's been easier to hide the gospel? We live in a society where there seems to be no shame today. Shame seems to be something that's no longer a feature in the 21st century. Things that were once regarded as, as shameful, depraved, are now tolerated and accepted. Indeed, to speak against such things, we are seen as intolerant and bigoted and biased. And we can be ashamed of many things, but we should never be ashamed of the gospel. It has the power to transform. And yet there's a reluctance to make it known. You know, whenever Paul shared the gospel, it was no picnic for him. In 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about what it was like for him to be an evangelist and to go with the gospel message. And he did go, and he continued to go. And this is what he says himself about his experience in laboring for the Lord and taking the message out to people who had never heard. And he says this, are they ministers, speaking of uh, earlier mention of people who work for the Lord in that chapter 2, Corinthians 11, he says, I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A day and night I have been in the deep, and journeyings often in perils and waters, and perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, 
perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. In weariness, painfulness, hunger and thirst and fasting and cold and nakedness. Why did he put himself through all that? Because of the power of the message of the gospel. He was not ashamed. Today, there seems to be no shame in society. But what about us who have this wonderful message? Are we ashamed? Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He also says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And he said in 2 Timothy 5 to Timothy, a church leader, do the work of an evangelist. Among all the other responsibilities that Timothy was involved in and in leading our fellowship, he was also to be sure that he didn't forget to do the work of an evangelist. And I was just thinking about the seriousness of that on myself as I prepared this message. And so I, I did a little stop take. I'm accountable to the assembly here. I did a kind of self-assessment. Just over the last 12 months, have I been doing the work of an evangelist? And I'm glad to be able to say that through your prayers and the open doors that the Lord has given me, that I have been able to, in the last 12 months, present the gospel to over 800 unsaved people in this area. Why? Because they need to hear. They need to hear. It's the power of God unto salvation. Paul's saying, this is a serious matter. This is a massive issue. This is a great responsibility. I'm sure there are possibly some, well, I know there are some school and college teachers who are here, but maybe as you look back on your earlier days, uh, some of us preachers do as well, and you're maybe ashamed of some of, some of the things you taught, and some of your lessons weren't that great. We can be ashamed of some of the things that we have thought were important and good. And... But if you have been trying to let your class know about Jesus, and if I've been trying to preach Jesus, nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, there's plenty wrong with the messenger, but there's nothing wrong with the message. Maybe there are parents here and perhaps you're ashamed of some of the advice you gave your children over the years or, or some of the advice you failed to give them. Maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking of the example you might have led, the influence you might have had. And there are many things that cause us to be ashamed. But in spreading the gospel, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or youth worker, or just a believer who loves the Lord and loves the lost, there's nothing to be ashamed in preaching and teaching and spreading the good news that Jesus is our only hope. John Huss lived a century before the Reformation. He was a proclaimer of Bible truth. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. From the 6th of July, 1415, Huss was taken from a cell where he, many had pleaded with him, recant, recant. He could have so easily hid the gospel. He could have gone underground. And even at the very end, as they were leading him to the stake, they gave him another opportunity. But he preferred to pray. And he said, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. Have mercy on my enemies. He was not ashamed. It's a message worth dying for, and many have. But sadly, it's a message that many hide. But it's a message about a person. It's not the gospel of the church. It's the gospel of Christ. 
Peter says in Acts 4, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's about Jesus. It's not about a movement. It's not about an ideology. It is the gospel of Christ that's the power of God unto salvation. Paul writes to Timothy again, 2 and 5, 1 Timothy 2 and 5, There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. No other one could bridge the gap, and what a gap it is, between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of we, his creation. Only Jesus could do that. And Hebrews 7 says, Wherefore, he, that is Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. There's no other one who's able, and that's why it's the gospel of Christ. Peter says, 1 Peter 3 and 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. It's the gospel of Christ. It's all about Jesus it's all about his suffering and death for us. It's all about the outpouring of God's wrath that we've just been talking about on his son. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's all about that instead of on us. And it's all about us accepting Jesus' perfect work on the cross as our only hope of salvation. It's all about a person. And the message is greater than the messenger. It's the power of God. This is the age of celebrity and big names sell products. And the advertisers know the, the power of the messenger to a point. But of course, as soon as that celebrity makes a mistake, has a moral lapse in their life, they're axed, and their power to sell stuff is gone overnight. Now, the gospel message is greater than the messenger. Paul was a messenger of the gospel and an evangelist. But here's what he said about himself. 1 Corinthians 2. I, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of the Spirit that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's not a Baptist message. Although I'm glad Baptists preach it. And it's not about baptism. Sophie and Luke, before they ever enter this water, have been redeemed, saved, set free. Know it. Their sins are gone. And this is a picture of a grave as they identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for them and for their sin. The water will do nothing to them except assist us in this wonderful picture of what Jesus means to us. It's God's message and it's our privilege to bring it to you and it's our longing that you would know that message tonight if you're here and this is new to you you've tried to make it as simple as we can but if you want to speak further to us we'd be happy to help you it still has tonight the power to change lives the power to rid you of all that would keep you out of God's heaven. 
And that's why we love the gospel. And it's a message for everyone. To the Jew and also the Greek. When you read those two words together, the Jew and the Greek in the New Testament, it really means the Jew and everyone else who isn't Jewish. So the message is for everyone. Paul said at the beginning of our reading, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So they were just one of many centers where he had gone. And of course he was limited as to how many places he could preach, how many areas he could reach, although we're amazed at what he did accomplish. But whether it was Rome or whether it's Monkstown or Jordanstown or White Abbey or Mossley or Ballyduff, Ballyclare, Carrick, Green Island, around this area here, the gospel has come. And you're hearing it tonight. Maybe somebody here has heard it many times. Maybe someone here has been brought up under the sound of the gospel, not only in your place of fellowship, but also at home. When Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he said this to his disciples, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both at Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This message is for everyone. And perhaps you need to hear that tonight, for maybe you know the, the life you've lived. Maybe you know the things you've done. Maybe you have been an open Christ rejecter. This message is still for you. And we are still in the day of grace, and we thank God for that. But it's a message that must be believed. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Listen to these words from the book of the Revelation, right at the end of the book. And in chapter 21, verse 8, we read these. But the fearful and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I left something out of that list. And here's what it reads. The fearful and unbelieving. Jesus says in Mark 16, He that believeth shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. John 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Hebrews 10. We are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. John 3. We remember 16. What about 18? He that believeth not. You don't have to wait to the other side to know this. He that believeth not is condemned already. This is believers baptism. Sophie and Luke have already believed. They believe the gospel. And there will always, baptistry is probably different to what you would be used to maybe in other places of worship. And the mode may be different to what you've seen. The main difference is this is for believers only. And we're so glad and we're so thrilled, along with the families of both of these young people, that they're saved. And it would be their joy and delight that somebody else might come to know Jesus, even this evening. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I hope and pray that we're not just 
not ashamed of the gospel when we're cosily tucked within the four walls of a meeting house. I hope we're also not ashamed when we meet with those who don't normally come under the sound of God's word. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What about you? Another picture we have in baptism for believers, that it's, it's an act of humility. Not the best look, you know, when you go down in and come up out like a drowned rat. It is an act of humility. But I wonder, is there somebody here tonight, and that's the issue, that's the problem, humbling yourself before God and accepting him on his terms because he is longing to accept you. Will you come to him? Let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for the gospel message that reached us. We thank you for the power of the gospel that changed us. We will be amazed one day when we stand in glory and see what you have brought us to because of the gospel. We will wonder even more that you ever allowed Jesus to come and do what he did so that the gospel message would be a message. Oh, Lord, we don't want anyone in this place to miss out on that. And we ask, dear Father, that you would speak loudly when the preacher's voice is silent. And that as we proceed with the baptisms, there might be a, a deep sense that we are doing serious things tonight and we are portraying something that is profoundly beautiful and absolutely essential believing on the Lord Jesus Christ Amen Well, as we go and get changed, Mike is going to come and lead us in the closing song at this stage. And then uh, we'll be out as quickly as we can in due course. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we have a wonderful song to sing now, which uh, Luke has chosen. It's his hymn for the night, and it's I'm Not Ashamed to Own My Lord or to defend his cause. I will even maybe clap during the chorus just to, because it's a lovely song and it's just to bring it to life. Jeannie, is not right? We'll clap during the chorus. Okay, we'll stand.
Now there could be a little pause before those that are taking part come back. And we could have kept on singing, that wouldn't have done any harm, but we're going to sing a little, uh, a couple of verses of I'd Rather Have Jesus. And we'll sing those just while we sit. And we might sing one verse in a chorus, we might sing two verses in a chorus. We'll just fill this up until the guys come in. And then just one point of practical uh, note is that whenever the candidates go through baptism, as they come up out of the waters, the chorus or the, the, the chorus of the um, hymn that they chose will be singing that. So that will come up immediately. And I know it might be, a, you know, you want to celebrate and we'll be able to do that afterwards. But what we want is them to have the lingering uh, hearing of what they, the hymn that they chose as they leave the waters of baptism. Anyway, let's sing and we'll see how we go here. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Sophie, are you saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone? Then in confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus, we now baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Then in confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus, we now baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to sing our last hymn, we'll all um, stand, I'd Rather Have Jesus is the uh, one we're going to sing, I'd Rather Have Jesus Than Silver or Gold, I'd Rather Be His Than Have Riches.
I'd rather have Jesus than a fast domain. For some, that might seem a really strange thing to say tonight, Father, but as we come humbly before you at the end of this wonderful meeting, we thank you that we can say those words from the depths of our heart. Lord, we thank you for the waters of baptism. We thank you for what we have witnessed tonight. We thank you for Luke and, and Sophie for their show of faith and going through the waters. Father, as I think back those many years to when I went through the waters, I thank you, Lord, and I can only pray that for Luke and for Sophie, that like me, they will wish that they could serve you more, love you more, be with you more down through the years. Because, Lord, as the years go by, you come to value and know you deeper and deeper. And so, Lord, we pray this earnestly for this young man and young woman. And so, Lord, as we continue on uh, and enjoy some fellowship together, Lord, we thank you for the food. We thank you for the hands that have prepared it. And Lord, whenever everything is done, we just pray that you'll take us to our homes in safety. So Lord, we thank you. We give you all our grateful thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.